Thank you very much indeed again to Emmanuel this evening. That was absolutely wonderful, and we thank him so much for ministering to us this evening. I want you to turn with me to the Word of God, please, to Paul's epistle to the Galatians, and we're in chapter 2 tonight. Galatians, and we're in chapter 2. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, and we're in chapter 2 tonight. I want to ask you a wee question before I read my text tonight. Here's the question. I wonder tonight, can you honestly say to yourself, wonder tonight, can you honestly claim for yourself, wonder tonight, can you honestly believe for yourself the greatest truth that any hymn writer ever put upon paper? The greatest truth that any hymn writer could put upon paper. Wonder tonight, can you honestly say this? Wonder tonight, can you honestly claim this? I wonder honestly tonight, do you believe this? Here's the greatest truth that I believe any hymn writer ever put on paper. Jesus loves me. This I no. Wonder do you believe that tonight? Wonder tonight, can you really say that? Jesus loves me. This I know. Because every person tonight born into this world, regardless of color, regardless to religion, regardless to creed, regardless to race, can honestly say, Jesus loves me. This I know. But not too many people perhaps may believe that tonight, but they ought to believe it because it's true. And I believe that's one of the greatest truths that was ever put to paper, Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, friend, tonight, those are the three greatest words that any sinner can ever discover. Jesus loves me. The worst person on this earth tonight can honestly quote those words, Jesus loves me. The most wickedest person upon this world tonight can claim those words, Jesus loves me. The dying thief that day could say, Jesus loves me. Saul of Tarsus, who hated Christ and who hated Christians, could find out one day on the Damascus Road, Jesus loves me. Every person tonight, whether good or bad, can honestly say that tonight, Jesus loves me. Even the poorest person on this earth can say, Jesus loves me. Do you remember Bartimaeus the blind man could say, Jesus loves me? You remember the leper in Luke, Mark's, Matthew's Gospel chapter, chapter number 8? Even the poor leper could say, Jesus loves me. A number of years ago, a little baby girl was was born in a prison. Right throughout the pregnancy, her mummy continued to use drugs, crack, heroin, cocaine, the whole lot. The wee girl, as I said, was born in prison. She had nothing going for her. 
Because her mommy used drugs while she was pregnant, that took great effect on the wee baby as it was growing inside her. The wee baby was born, and when she was four, she was taken into care of Christian, a Christian couple. She never uttered a word, and she was very hard to handle, and she was filled with fear. But the lady took this wee troubled girl on her knee every day without fail, and she used to rock the wee girl in the rocking chair and hold her tight and sing that hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Many weeks, many months had passed, and every evening without fail, this woman would take the wee girl on her knee and rock back and forward, rock back and forward, singing that hymn, Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. But one day, friends, she took her on her knee. As normal, she rocked back and forward. But this time, the woman didn't sing. And for the first time, that little girl spoke, and she turned around and looked up into the woman's face and says, Are you not going to sing about the man who loves me? I want you to know tonight, unsafe friend tonight, Jesus loves you. In spite of who you are tonight, Jesus loves you. Now, I want you to turn to Galatians 2 and 20, because there's my text tonight. My text is the very little last phrase. We're going to read the verse together, and then I'm going to quote the text, and this is what it says. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Here's my text of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's my text tonight. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. You know, friends, this evening when you look at that text tonight, You'll notice there's a person that stands out. I, a person. And in that text, you'll clearly see tonight that that person is the Son of God. God's only Son. I wonder tonight what God's only Son means to you. I know perhaps you've heard the gospel story over and over again tonight, but what does the Son of God really mean to you? You know, the greatest verse in the Bible, I'm sure, has got to be John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And you, and you say to yourself, when you think of what happened in Brussels on Tuesday, and you think of the murder and mayhem and destruction in our world, you say to yourself, how on earth could God love this world? How could God love a wicked, vile world as the world we live in today? You know, that's a mystery. It's a mystery how God could love this wicked, vile, evil world. But God loves the world. In spite of this world's wickedness, and in spite of the evil in this world, I can tell you, God loves this world. God loved the world of sinners lost, remember the hymn writer said. Ruined by the fall, salvation full at highest cost, he offers free to all. But you know, friend, tonight, 
the greatest gift this world has ever known and the greatest gift you'll ever know tonight is the gift of God's only begotten Son. The Son of God. What does he mean to you tonight? God's lovely Son. I was reading the other day a wee story of a man called John Griffith, and I heard this story shortly after my conversion. John Griffith worked on a railway station in Mississippi, and he worked as one of the, of the bridge operators. He was the man in charge to open and close the bridge for the railway. John Griffith had a six-year-old son. That's all the age he was, six. Decided to bring him to work one day. The wee lad wanted to see all round where Daddy worked and Daddy brought him along. The bridge was up to let the ships through, or the boats through. And the time came when the train was approaching, the father went to bring the bridge down to let the train pass over. When he started the machines up, there was a mighty screen that came down from below. The father pushed the button, stopped the machinery, and ran down only to find his wee lad, the only son he had, pulled into the machine. The father tried frantically to set him free, to pull him out, but he was too far in for it. Desperately, he tried, but he could do nothing. He looked at his son and he thought of the train that was coming. And the father had a choice to make. Let the people on the train perish or start the machine, meaning his own son's death. I don't know what I could have done if I was in John Griffith's shoes. I think I would have just let the train go, but John Griffith done something that I believe I couldn't have done. He ran over to the son who was crying and said and cried in screeching voice, don't let me die, Daddy, don't let me die. And he kissed the son on the cheek. He says, I love you, son. John Griffith went up to the control tower, closed his ears, started the machinery, gave his son for the bridge to come down. And as the bridge came down, it came down just in time. John Griffith went out to the side of the bridge and he held the wee lad's coat up and says, listen, this is what I have given for you. But they were oblivious for what was done. You know, friends, tonight sinners are oblivious as to what God has done with his son. In order tonight that sinners could be saved, and I wonder tonight, are you oblivious? To the great demonstration of God's love for you, that he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. No friend this evening does that not touch your heart tonight, to know that the Son of God died to save you. Because you see, dear unsafe friend, tonight as that bridge was up, there was a gap there that needed to be gapped. For those people to live. And I want to tell you, sinner friend, tonight, there's a gap 
and our gulf tonight between you and eternal life. That can't be gap. Because of your sin, because of sin tonight, there's a gulf between you and heaven that no man can, can fathom. And tonight, I want you to know that God sent his son to the cross to bridge that gulf. Religion can't bridge it. Rituals can't bridge it. Traditions can't bridge it. God help you if you're dependent on traditions. If there's one word I hate tonight and it's traditions for there's damn more souls in hell than anything. Tradition. I hate that word. But I want you to know, dear unsaved friend tonight, there's a gulf between you and heaven. There's a gulf between you and God. There's a gulf between you and eternal life. And sin has put it there. But there's one, praise God tonight, who can bridge the gulf. God's only Son. And friend, he bridged that gulf for you. And he bridged that gulf for me. When he went to the cross at Calvary, tell me tonight, sinner friend, does this not touch your heart at all? Does this not touch you? Does this not trouble you? Does this not tug you tonight? To think this evening that it took the Son of God to come and to bridge the cough by being crucified to the cross. I could never begin tonight to imagine the motion, the emotions, and to imagine the pain that Father had to bear to start that machine, knowing that his son would die. And I'll tell you this, friend, no wonder the heavens bowed in midnight morning when the Lord Jesus went to the cross and died there. Friend, the Son of God tonight's in that text. But I want you to notice there's more than a person in that text tonight. Take a good look at it again because there's a passion in that text because it says there, the Son of God who loved me. Who loved See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled out. Did there such love and sorrow me? Our thorns composed, so rich a crown. Friend, tonight, let's return to the place which is called Calvary. Let us look again upon that old rugged cross and say, yes, Jesus loves me. This I know. Because it was there where he hung in shame. It was there where he took my blame. It was there where he loved me. You know, dear unsafe friend tonight, nowhere else can the Savior's love be demonstrated. better or more clear than the cross on Calvary's hill. Ah, oh, dear unsafe friend, your greatest, story, your greatest discovery tonight will be 
to know Jesus loves you. One of the great stories of the Bible, of course, is the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story well, don't you? You know the story about the man going down to Jericho who fell among thieves. Do you remember how they wounded him and they left him half dead? You know, that's the way sin left, leaves us all tonight. Left him half dead. And the first boy would have come along. He was a priest. He was the religious boy. But you know, the religious man, he looked upon him and walked away. You see, that's what religion does for you at the end of the day. That's what religion will do for anybody. It will just look at you and walk away. You know why? Because religion can't and won't do anything for you. And then you'll read on, and the Malbury comes along. He's the Levite. He's the righteous boy. He comes along, and he looks upon the poor dying man on the road, and what does he do? He walks on. He hasn't time to wait on him or look after him, not at all. Then you know the story, don't you? The Samaritan, he comes along, and it says, and he looked upon him and had compassion on him. And it says he went to him, and he got right down to where he was. And it says he lifted him. You know, I'm sure that man who was lying on the road got the shock of his life when he looked up into the eyes and the one that loved him and the one that lifted him and the one that cared for him was the one he rejected and hated because he was a Samaritan. And yet it was the Samaritan that loved him. You know who loves you tonight? The person whose name you take in vain, that's who loves you. Do you know the one who loves you? To, the one who you despise and reject. That's who loves you. You know the one who wants to save you tonight is the one that died for you on the cross. What love. What mercy. What grace. Do you see the person in that text? Do you see the price in that text? I'm going to finish now. Do you see the price in that text? The price. There's the person, the Son of God. There's the passion who loved me. Here's the price now. And gave himself for me. That's the price it had to be paid for poor lost sinners to be saved from sin and to be saved from going to hell. The price tonight is displayed on the cross, two arms outstretched, the bleeding wound the precious blood. And tonight, here's what the cross says, paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. You see, Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 37, asks a question. What shall a man give in exchange for a soul. Do you know what a man can give? Absolutely nothing. We have lovely neighbors next door, Paula and Marcus. And they had a lovely wee Yorkshire Terrier dog, Jack was his name. And there, Jack and our Archie were like two children. I used to say to our lad, that's our wee dog, by the way, Jack's outside. And there he was scraping at the door, and the two might let them into our patio, and the two of them would run about and play. But one day, just before Christmas, Paula came in with Jack in her arms. He was a 
loveliest wee dog you could have ever known. Lovely. And she came in in desperation. She says, George, will you take me to the, to the vet because Jack's not well? I says, Paula, get him wrapped up there and we'll get you into the vet. And I got the two of them into the car and away off to the vet. I says, I don't be worrying about Jack, Gail. They'll give him a wee jag and they'll run about in no time. Well, I brought them into the vet and I was there for about half an hour and Paula came out in floods of tears. What am I going to do, George? He needs an operation. And it's going to cost us 800 pounds. We don't have the money. We don't have the, the money. And because they hadn't the money, they had to allow wee Jack to die. Unsafe friend tonight, you need something. And you don't have the money to pay for it. And instead of letting you die, there was one who was willing to pay the price for you to be saved. For you to have life. For you to have hope. That person tonight is the Lord Jesus. Friend, look to the cross tonight. As a hopeless sinner, for that's all the way we were all born into this world, just hopeless sinner. And I can look to the cross tonight and say, Jesus loves me, he who died heaven's gates to the open way. He gave himself. That's the measure of the price. For me, that's the mystery. But he did it. Because he loves us. Close your eyes, sinner friend, and quote those words to me. Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. But tonight the tomb is empty. Tonight he's alive. Tonight he wants to save you. Let us pray, please. Let's take a wee moment together. Lord, we just look to thee tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you will indeed speak. We thank you for your love. Now bless your word to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 200, please.